All right, today we're going to talk about civil rights. We're going to look at different groups and what that looks like within our country, within the United States. So starting out, what are our civil rights? These are the things that our government protects, they put into place to guarantee that we have equal treatment, that we're not going to be discriminated against, and that we have things as individuals that are protected by our government and put into place so that we all have equal rights within our country. And we're going to see that that was not the case um, going on. And so in the 50s, 60s and forward, we're going to have some major movements that are going to push for changes within our country. So starting out, giving kind of a back date of some things that were going on, we did have slavery here within the United States. That's, you know, nothing new. Um, in 1808, our government did start to take um, some movements and try to do some things to end slavery or uh, do away with slavery. They first banned slave trade, meaning that no more would ships be coming into our country delivering slaves. But they did not do away with the current slaves that we have. They just stopped any more new from coming in. We see the Missouri Compromise. At this point in time, our government's trying to break the chains of slavery. We have Missouri was wanting to come in as a new state. And they're wanting to come in as a slave state, which is going to make the slave state versus non-slave states unequal. And our government feared that that was not going to be beneficial and that was not going to help end slavery within our country. So the Missouri Compromise, what it did, it said Missouri can come in as a state and as a slave state. However, we will add Maine as a free state to keep the balance. Also at this point in time, you had many people speaking out against the atrocity of slavery. You know, we take for granted here in the 21st century, we have social media and within seconds of something happening, we know that it happened. There's a Facebook post, there's a Twitter post, there's, you know, a TikTok, whatever it may be, we instantly have access to see what's happening and what is going on within our country. In this time frame, you're looking at in, you know, late 1800s, 1860s, people did not have that type of communication. So things could be going on down the street, in town, whatever it may be, the state very next door, and people wouldn't even know how bad it was or how, mistre how mistreated some of these human beings, these American citizens, were. So people like William Lord Garrison were using their capabilities to get the word out. He had a newspaper called The Liberator, and he would use this newspaper to share the horrible stories of slavery and how slaves were being mistreated um, and how not, you know, us in our time frame, yes, we realize that slavery is horrible, and to have a human as your property, that is just unthinkable and it is a it is horrible atrocity that never should have happened within our country. In this time frame, that was normal to some people. And they assumed that their slaves that were being housed or clothed or medically treated, you know, as human beings was also the case at the plantation next door or the plantation in the next state. And that often was not the case. And so William Lord Garrison showed them that, said, look, not everybody's being treated as fairly as you think that they are. Also, we have Harriet Beecher Stowe. She writes Uncle Tom's Cabin. Once again, a way of showing people how slaves are being mistreated, how this is inhumane, how this is not fair, how it is not equal, and that no American citizen should be treated this way. Um, the Scott Sanford case, the Dred Scott case, uh, he sues for his freedom. He's like, well, you know, look, I am an American citizen and I should be able to be free within this country. The, uh, the Supreme Court rules, no, slaves are not American citizens, therefore they cannot sue um, for their freedom. And so that does not change. You see the date, 1857. So we haven't quite made it into the Civil War yet. So the Civil War starts April 12, 1861, and will continue on until April the 9th, 1865. During this time, our President Abraham Lincoln, he and our government, they're working together to try to end slavery, to try to do away with this horrible uh, uh, aspect that we have, this horrible system that we have within our country. He issues one of his orders in 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation, that uh, does away with slavery. Where the issue came into play, at this point in time, 
a lot of our states, our southern states specifically, they had seceded from the Union. They had withdrawn. So they were no longer, in their minds, a part of our federal government. So when the President of the United States issued this proclamation freeing slaves, they ignored it because they, did, they were no longer a part of that government. He was not their leader, so therefore they did not have to listen to what he said. So even though he technically freed the slaves in 1863, it would be another two years before they would officially receive um, their freedom with the end of the Civil War. Now, after the Civil War, we do have some amendments come about. The 13th Amendment is your uh, slavery ending amendment. Your 14th Amendment declares that African Americans are citizens because what happened was when the um, slaves were freed, some of the people got together and said, okay, that's fine. Um, well, then here's the way we're going to do away with that. Well, they came over on a ship or they're from Africa. They're not American citizens. So let's send them back to their home country because they're not American citizens. Our government stepped up and said, no, if you are born within the United States of America, you are an American citizen, period. We will see this 14th Amendment, even though when it initially was formed was for African Americans, it is still pushed forward until today. And in the, in the 21st century, if you were born in America, you are an American citizen, period. The 15th Amendment comes about during this time, and it allows African American males to vote. At this point, women are still not allowed to vote in this country, whether they're white, black, whatever. They still do not have the right to vote. So we see a whole new set of discrimination within our country. Slavery is done away with. So African Americans, they have their freedom. They have um, a chance at the American dream at this point in time. So people out of ignorance, out of hate, um, what, out, whatever it may be, a struggle for power, they start to institute these other rules, regulations, processes in order to keep the power um, that they have obtained over the start of our country. They institute the Black Codes, and what the Black Codes do, this prevents African Americans from voting, from being able to serve on a jury, all of these type of things that Mer Americans use as a way to better our country. If you can't vote, then you can't put people into office that are going to help um, make our country better. If you can't vote, you can't vote someone out of our country that is doing things that are despicable or inhumane. Then comes along the Jim Crow Laws. With the Jim Crow laws, these are your segregation laws. And with it, this makes it to where restaurants are um, white only. Or the whites can sit in this section and the black customers had to go through the back door or sit in another area. Um, courtrooms are segregated. Water fountains are segregated. Um, classrooms. Anything and everything is segregated in this part under Jim Crow, Jim Crow laws. Um, voting interference. Remember, we talked about um, the African American males getting the right to vote underneath the 16th Amendment. So then, um, what some of our powerful white leaders did, they instituted things like poll tax literacy tests. And what that does, one, that not only affected your African Americans, but this affects uh, your poor white farmers, your sharecroppers, those that, remember we talked about um, in the previous presentation, that people who were farmers oftentimes had to work in the field. They didn't have time to get an education because they had to help their parents feed their family. So they didn't know how to read. Or they were struggling from paycheck to paycheck to pay their bills. So they didn't have extra money to pay to vote. Um, the literacy test, not only, and you can Google these. It's interesting um, just for, you know, on your own time. Google literacy test examples. Um, and it is amazing. It's not just, you know, read the sentence, the cat ran up the hill or the dog barked at the cat. No, oftentimes, they were silly made up sentences that even someone who was, who was literate, even college educated, couldn't pass it because the question was set up to purposely cause the person to fail. So it was one way to ensure that these people with newfound rights were not going to get a right to vote so that things that had been set up in our country were going to continue to maintain. So we have Plessy versus Ferguson. We're talking about the Jim Crow laws. So Homer Plessy decides that he doesn't want to get into the black train car. He wants to sit where he wants to sit. And so he sues for his right. He goes to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court rules 
that one, segregation is a state's issue, that that state has the right to decide that if they want to be segregated, and two, it instituted the separate but equal, that segregation was okay, that separate facilities was okay, but that those facilities were to be equal. We know that in this case, and continuing on with schools and other facilities, the equal part was often not there. Schools, uh, black schools were often not uh, funded as well as your white schools. They didn't have access to as many desks or textbooks or whatever it may be. Um, things were separate but definitely were not equal. So we start to see people get together and bring about change. It takes people standing up. We talked um, about um, Harriet Beecher Stowe and William Lloyd Garrison, different ones speaking out, trying to make things better. Uh, the NAACP is formed in 1909. W.E. Du Bois, Ida B. Wells, different ones, they gather together to create an organization that is going to fight for the advancement of colored people, African Americans, making sure they are being treated fairly and equally within our country. The first step of making some change within our country legally on the grounds of segregation was the Sweet versus Painter case, which occurred in Texas. And after it was over and after it goes through, our government said that higher level, basically your colleges, they were going to be integrated. Um, so this was our very first step of integrating public schools, which leads to Brown v. Board of Education. And with Brown v. Board of Education, after a long process, and actually two Brown v. Board of Educations, Public schools are integrated, and it wasn't an overnight process. It took years. Ruby Bridges, a little six-year-old child trying to integrate in Louisiana, had horrible things said to her, and her family was attacked, and she had to be taken to school by National Guard just simply because she was a little black child wanting to attend an all-white school. So definitely, you know, on your own time, you can look up different cases of Board of Education of the Brown v. Board of Education. Ruby Bridges is a really good story and Disney made a fantastic movie about her that shows what she experienced as a child and some of the negative side of it um, that she was being treated and how um, her family was. So other people pushing for equality. So the Civil Rights Movement officially kicks off. Uh, Rosa Parks, um, she refuses to give up her seat. She's worked all day. She's tired. She's, you know, a very famous seamstress and she doesn't want to get up and move because they've decided they need a larger white only section on the bus and so when she refuses to be uh, moved to the back of the bus she's arrested and things like that it gets people's attention because she's highly respected and loved it leads to the montgomery bus boycott that happened for well over a year so um martin luther king jr we see him he is the leader of the civil rights movement key figure, uh, Baptist preacher, you know, preaching nonviolence, like, look, we need to let our voice be heard, we need to make a difference, but we don't need to lower ourselves to the, to the level of the people who are harming us. We need to stay up here while we push for equal rights, while we try to make this country better. So he creates the Southern Christian Leadership Council. They're the ones who are your college-age students who were going around doing sit-ins. They would go into restaurants that were for whites only, or they would sit in the whites only section and they would just simply sit there. They didn't do anything but sit there and bring attention. They were often attacked. The Freedom Riders, they were, you know, trying to break up the segregation on the bus. They would ride from state to state, from town to town. August the 63, he gives his famous I Have a Dream speech at the a March on Washington, where 250,000 people attended in order to fight for the civil rights of our African-American citizens. The Civil Rights Act of 64 is passed, and with it, it says that you cannot be discriminated against based on race or color, religion, gender, etc. It also created the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. This monitors and forces that make sure employers are following this, that they are not discriminating against those based on color, gender, race, creed, etc. Okay, within our country, as African Americans are fighting for their right to vote, women are also fighting for their rights as well. The National American Women's Suffrage Association, formed in 1890, focuses strictly on, or mainly on, the right for women to vote, because that's how they're going to change things within our country. Key figures, Susan B. Anthony, Alice Paul, Ida B. Wells, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and so forth. 
on. There's a very good movie, Alice Paul, uh, Iron Jawed Angels. And it shows you the dark inside of what these women faced. And that's why it's important, especially women of America, to go vote when you have the right. Because women like Alice Paul were literally put in jail for fighting simply for the right to vote. So don't ever take that for granted. So in 1920, women finally do gain the right to vote with the 19th Amendment. The fight doesn't stop there because though we have the right to vote, women are still treated unequally. They are looked upon as, you know, this dramatic hormonal being who's meant to take care of her husband and have children. So we're going to see where that is fault. Even in today's time, that has to be something that is stood up against. The Feminine Mystique was written to show that, you know, okay, World War II, women kept our country going. Women helped us win the war. So why, after 1940, did we settle back in to this, you know, June Cleaver aspect of a woman that she's supposed to sit at home with her pretty little dress wearing pearls, taking care of the man and taking care of the children? So it challenged women, and you see a rebirth uh, of the women's movement. The Civil Rights Movement of 64 also affects women because the uh, Civil Rights Act that gave American, uh, that uh, ensured African Americans their rights also ensures women. The National Organization of Women formed in 66 continues to fight for equal rights for women. Also, you have other groups within America that have fought and are still fighting for equal rights. Native Americans, they have been moved from one side of the country to the other um, different times as our country moved. They would be uprooted and moved and their traditions and things like that taken for granted and pushed aside. Our government stepped forward and a lot of them land for them to continue their tribes and also allowed them the um, tribal councils and things like that on these reservations. They are their own government entity and so they are kind of self-governing under the umbrella of our government. Hispanic Americans, very, very important to many aspects of our country. In this case, agricultural. You have a, a lot of Hispanics who come into our country to help with the farming industry. They oftentimes were not paid an equal wage or for what they were doing. So key people like Cesar Chavez stepped up and said, you know what? We're going to fight for our rights, and it's not fair to be paid less just because we are Hispanic. There is a certain wage that's expected, and we too should receive that. And he starts a boycott within the grape industry, and it gets people's attention, and he successfully forms the first labor union for um, Hispanics within our country. So today, with um, civil rights, we've talked about many different groups, many different things going on within our country. There's lots and lots of videos out there that you can watch to get a little bit more information about each little piece that we've talked about. So if there's someone you're not familiar with, um, when the Civil Rights Movement, African American related, the untold story of Emmett Till that was produced by HBO, you can find the video on YouTube. It does a really good job of showing what happened. There's firsthand accounts from his cousins and things that were there and what his family um, experienced and how his tragic death was the kickstart of our civil rights movement. Um, as students who are watching this, it's very important to realize that teenagers, young children were involved in the civil rights movement as well. The Children's March um, that took place, Google it. There are lots of videos, first-hand accounts of how students who went into the streets and marched and protested when their parents couldn't because their parents had jobs and things like that, they stood up and let their voice be heard. So lots of material out there so please take advantage of those that are on google so that you can get further information